Hi, my name is Jack Davenport and I've recorded the audiobook of The Calibi Code, written by Johnny Sweet and published by Belinda Audio. Well, that's easy. Um, uh, it's a truth universally acknowledged that um, a lot of books that get turned into audiobooks aren't very well written, but this is not one of those books. Um, I was very impressed with Johnny's um, he's a very lyrical writer, actually. Um, he's not afraid of an extended metaphor. And there are passages that are um, shockingly literary, if I'm honest, in a contemporary novel. Um, and I like a writer who's not afraid of style and high style in some cases. Um, because oftentimes in contemporary books, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of dialogue and little else, which is fine, but um, in my humble opinion, isn't necessarily what constitutes a novel, it's more a radio play. Um, so I was drawn to the sophistication of Johnny's writing. Um, I think it's a pretty cracking story. Um, he's an interesting character, Edward, um, our Edward Jevons. Uh, goes through a lot of quite complex psychological situations which he tries to square with his conscience um, with varying degrees of success um, and also I think the world of it I found kind of fun um, you know there are um, antecedents to this sort of book um, Patricia Highsmith is probably uh, up on that list somewhere a little bit of Brideshead Revisited um, there's a lot of fun kind of class stuff in there, which gives me the opportunity to do lots of stupid voices, which is always a joy uh, in, a, in an audio book. Um, and yeah, I think those are the, those are the things I uh, that drew me to want to, to read it. Um, basically, it's a cracking good novel. Um, and there's vanishingly few of those that actually uh, come out in any given year these days that, that have this kind of high sense of style as well as having a, a kind of rollicking good uh, narrative as well. Yes, I do. Um, it's quite simple, really. Um, with an audio book, the most important thing to be clear, or, clear of ahead of time is who's speaking and when, and to have made a few decisions ahead of time about how you think they might sound, be that with an accent or pitch or speed or whatever. So what I do is I go through the book, um, reading it quite closely. And every time somebody speaks, I put a little pencil mark, a little dash, and then uh, either a letter for their name or, um, or just a letter for their name, basically. So that in simple terms, as my eye goes from left to right, and then back to left again, the first thing it lands on is an indicator of who's talking. Um, because otherwise, if you don't do that, you're forever stopping and starting and trying to figure out who's talking and uh, thinking up on the spot how they might sound. Um, so yeah, that's that's my my preparation. Well, obviously our protagonist Edward Jevons simply because he's a complicated individual um, with a lot roiling away beneath the surface um, which of course you know the internalized nature of the novel as a form allows you know the, the listener or the reader to get more of a sense of what's going on inside him as he's in these various in some cases very extreme situations. Um, I also kind of enjoyed from, from just literally from a, a a sort of performance point of view you know Edward is continually pretending to be someone slightly someone that he is not and um playing with various levels of disguise or an inability to disguise depending on the situation that he finds himself in uh, has been kind of fun to sort of modulate. I have enjoyed enormously trying to figure out who on earth Francis Bunderston is based on. I think I've got a pretty good idea, but I'm not going to say that out loud in a recorded setting. Uh, 
but I'll discuss it with the writer after I've finished, so there. Um, well, this is a gigantic spoiler. The whole passage after um, Edward has bludgeoned D'Angelo to death, that's the spoiler, um, is a long, like, 15, 20 page run of entirely uh, internalized, very lyrical, um, rather gorgeous uh, sort of psychological descriptors of the kind of collapsing that's going on inside of Edward after the event of having committed undeniable murder as compared to the other maybe kind of sort of murder that he committed when he was at school. Um, and as I said, in part, in answer to question one, um, to me anyway, I mean, who am I to judge? But um, Johnny's ability to uh, write something of such a sustained, internalised, uh, somewhat lyrical uh, way about such an extreme set of psychological states, I found to be really very impressive. In fact, um, Mac, the producer, and I stopped at the end of it and both commented on what excellent writing it was, which, as I say, doesn't always happen when you're doing an audio book. So there we go. Well, I cannot tell a lie I don't listen to a lot of audiobooks, but I do listen to some. As I made an interesting discovery with audiobooks in the last couple of years, which is as follows. Um, every once in a while, I will read a novel that I enjoy very much. That, that happens quite a lot, but um, I'm quite careful about what I choose to read. Um, but every once in a while, when I've read something that I really have loved, I have found that quite soon after having read it, listening to the audiobook version of the book I have already read can um, generate whole new understandings of the text I've just read to myself. Ob obviously, you know, the information is um, entering your brain, not via the visual cortex, but by the auditory process. Um, and it is an entirely different way of absorbing text. Um, I discovered this slightly by accident um, because I am in a book group uh, back at home in New York and one of the books we um, had uh, chosen to read as a group I'd already read and I was um, doing a TV series at the time and I really didn't have the headspace to sit down when I was at work and what have you, waiting to shoot such stuff to, um, to read it again. Uh, but I did, but I had, it had been quite a long time since I'd read it and I had remembered enjoying the book enormous. The book was actually, it was called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which is by Gabriel Zevins, which is a monstrous hit. Um, uh, it's available now in all good bookshops. Um, uh, but I, so I sort of was like, oh, well, I'll just listen to it because that'll, I can, I can manage that in the bandwidth I have to spare for something that isn't the work I'm meant to be doing. And it was rather revelatory, actually. Um, I do also occasionally listen to um, uh, certain kinds of non-fiction uh, when I'm wandering about uh, where I live. Um, I, I listen to an, enorm an almost unhealthy amount of podcasts. So I'm not... Um, it's not an alien thing to me, listening to uh, narrated audio of various kinds. I'll go back to that one I just mentioned, the, the audio version of um, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Um, it was... Uh, the thing that made it... First of all, it's a fantastic book. Um, but second of all, uh, it's was 97% read by a young-ish, young, -ish, young uh, American woman. Um, there are three principal characters, but she narrated almost all of it. 
But there is a passage of the book where one of the three central characters is shot and is in kind is then in a coma for some time. And there's a couple of chapters in which you are essentially inside the mind of this character who is in a coma. And for that section, they used a male actor, um, which was kind of an unusual way of um, doing things. And that um, change of texture and speed and style, I found very affecting. It's, it's a very emotional section of the book. And uh, I liked it very much. Where I live uh, in New York, uh, I sound like a character in the book I'm currently reading, um, there is an extraordinarily beautiful small library called the Jefferson Market Library, which is a building that um, rather um, um, distressingly was previously a uh, either a women's prison or a women's insane asylum i'm not quite sure which but given what it's a very beautiful kind of rather gothic-y looking it looks it actually looks like something out of venice it's weird anyway so it had a very um distressing previous life but has been a library for oh, must be 75 years uh which is of course is an eon in american history terms um and it's very beautiful and it's very recently been completely uh, redone and it's at the end of my street and it always gives me enormous pleasure to go in there and hang out for a bit. And unlike the sort of more central libraries of the New York City public library system, it's not overwhelmingly large and frankly seething with tourists in a way that makes the main branch of the New York City public library, which is magnificent, but also um, not very quiet because it's full of people gawking at the ceilings in the reading room.